Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing fabulously well and that you've had a fabulous day or about to embark on one because you deserve it. But before we get started, don't forget to get that quintessential drink, whether it's something ice cold or something lovely and hot. Go and get it because I've got a fabulous story for you tonight. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up, and let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, Sheriff Ernest Farnborough looked exasperated and piqued. Of course he tried to hide his frustration with a wry smile, but it was exceedingly difficult to suppress the level of irritation that he was actually feeling. It was the third time this week that that annoying elderly woman had made her appearance known. She was perched in his offices right now, on his favourite black leather swivel chair. A very determined-looking woman, with frosted grey hair and pale blue eyes, who was tirelessly harassing him with her obscure, implausible claims. He had seen her type before. Truly, she was as annoying as a Rhode Island Red, pecking away at him tirelessly, or a feisty mosquito resolutely buzzing around him all night, eluding him of a peaceful night's sleep. If the truth be told, this badgering woman would be good for the force, as things tended to be flung to the wayside and placed on the back burner, like old cases, evidence reports or missing case files, that would probably be attended to swiftly and efficiently under this woman's watchful eye. In his mind's eye he could even foresee the neat filing system her efficiency would command, and the miraculous transformation of his unmethodical office from indiscriminate to systematic and ordered. Yet despite the obvious advantages of such an elderly woman hired by the force, he was secretly thankful someone like her was definitely not in their employ. As her constant nagging would drive him doodle alley, he mused privately to himself. His current secretarial assistant, also in the winter season of her life, was as slow as a sloth, who turned his office upside down with her chaotic organisational skills. She did have her good points, he assured himself. He scratched what remained of his thinning grey hair reflectively, pondering over what good points she actually had, if indeed she had any at all. For a while he couldn't think of a single redeeming quality about her, as his mind just kept drawing blanks. Suddenly his well-rounded face lit up brightly like a Christmas tree. He remembered something quite significant, very significant indeed. Of course, his secretarial assistant had always collected over a dozen caramel and apple doughnuts and several piping hot lattes from the baker every single day, and did so as a matter of routine, something that his formidable wife Kate would never ever countenance. He glanced down briefly at his inflating waistline and the oversized stomach that imbricated over his pants, the final resting place of the collective doughnuts that had left their indelible mark on his rather rotund physique. There had been times when his unkind wife, who was like a nauseating stick insect, eating about as much as a songbird, would sometimes call him her sweet little beached whale, and that was very humiliating and condescending to him. So in retaliation, he called her his sweet little praying mantis, and that had gone down like a lead balloon. But he was sticking to this new pet name for her, come hell or high water, despite her enraged protests. Serves her right, he thought smugly. That's what you get for making fun of me. In that second, he promptly decided that despite the fact that he looked like he was on the verge of giving birth to triplets, the doughnuts were not going anywhere. They were here to stay and for good. It was very tough being a police sheriff with the demands of a small town weighing heavily on your shoulders, the calls in the middle of the night about strange banging sounds that were inevitably just raccoons digging around in a dumpster, or someone else who claimed that they were having a dispute with a neighbour. He let out a huge sigh. Oh! which he tried to suppress by mimicking a yawn, while the annoying old woman rambled on and on, barely stopping to even draw breath. With his pen and paper, he continued to recall the details of her painstaking account that were almost identical and a replication of all her previous police reports that she had filed at the station over the last few days. It would seem a tall, shadowy, peeping Tom had sneakily been spying on her through the living room window, while she was knitting a sweater for her grandson when watching a BBC wildlife documentary on television, presented by the highly esteemed David Attenborough. I'm tired, Sheriff, very tired, she claimed, 
about you lot not doing a damn thing to help me about my current predicament. You're not taking me seriously at all. Her perceptive eyes glanced judiciously across the body of files that covered his mahogany desk untidily, as if deducing that the sheriff was clearly not the most organised of people, and unordered people had the propensity to rub her up the wrong way, for disorder was as alien to her as candy is to a lion. It was nonsensical to be this disorganised, surely. She could almost understand it if he was dealing with some of Chicago's lowlives and gangland shootings where ubiquitous criminal cases were piling up. But this was the quiet, peaceful community of Montana, for goodness sake, where crime was not exactly a huge problem. Yet by the look of the sheriff's desk, you would think he was inundated with criminal reports. "'You lot have only been around to my farmhouse once, Sheriff,' she complained." It's disgusting, it really is. You haven't even searched the wood grove on my property to ensure that there are no vagrants around. You lot have not done a thing to help me. It's sickening, quite sickening. Don't think I don't know the score. You think I'm a silly old batty woman who's hallucinating as a result of too much medication. But that's where you're wrong. I don't even take medication. Nothing at all. I may be in my eighties, Sheriff, but I'm of sound mind and in remarkably good health, I might add. But do you indulge in the occasional tipple? Well, I have a gin and tonic before bed from time to time, but, Sheriff, I've never ever overindulged, as it isn't a wise thing to do for a woman of my age. It would mess with my algorithms. So, Mrs Myers, shall we start from the very beginning? What exactly did you see that makes you believe you are dealing with a peeping Tom? asked the Sheriff. On this occasion it was the old woman's turn to sigh, but she didn't mask her increasing frustration, for indeed she hoped the sheriff would begin to appreciate her rising level of angst, as she discerned that someone had indeed been spying on her at her home. Whoever it was, he had wanted her to know that he was there. Possibly he got his kicks from scaring an old woman half to death, and if that was indeed his intention, he had succeeded with flying colours. Unfortunately, she hadn't been wearing the correct glasses to see the intruder clearly enough, but had perceived a sizeable blurry dark blob moving against the window pane, and caught the glimmer of the man's brown sparkling eye staring in at her, a terrifying sight that had sent her blood running cold and caused her heart to thump in her ears, and she had felt its powerful vibration in her chest for quite some time after the encounter. She'd even seen the figure gliding away towards the wood grove at the rear of her property. Who was he? What did he want from her? And why, oh why, did he seem so obsessed with gaining her attention? The very thought of this mysterious intruder sent horrifying chills down her spine like mini electric shocks. Paige Myers was no stranger to being stalked, for when she was a young woman she had been a knockout, quite a looker really, that had drawn the attention of many admiring male fans who had swooned over her like frenzied bees around a honeypot, or seemingly intoxicated and bedazzled by her exotic beauty, with her raven blue-black hair, flaxen-coloured skin, pretty heart-shaped face, high cheekbones, arched brows along with beguiling deep blue eyes that contrasted dramatically against her deep skin like aquamarine jewels. Unfortunately, while Paige had secretly enjoyed the attentions her flocking admirers had lavished upon her, the fleeting pleasures were soon eclipsed by the unsavoury obscene attentions of Joey Sutcliffe, for this was a young man she most certainly did not want to be acquainted with in any way. He hung around in the circles of some of Chicago's less desirable characters like a rather bad smell. He had spotted her once at the station and had trailed after her like a hound pursuing a fox, and from thenceforth never ever leaving her alone. What had been his absurd, twisted interest in her anyway, as they had nothing in common at all, and were both from opposite sides of the track, and she was well above his station? He knew that, yet he didn't care, for he wanted ownership of her more than anything else in the entire world. This unsavoury character looked every part the type of lad you would expect to find locked up in a prison cell for he was rough around the edges and hard-wired to be thuggish and aggressive like a pit bull terrier, but in human form, that is. Even his mean, cold eyes were like tiny slits, and his thin smile turned downwards in a perpetual skull, while his white anemic skin wore the indelible marks of a fighting dog. There were dozens of jagged, ugly scars embedded in his thick, stocky body like railway tracks, 
along with heeled over bullet holes, revealing the horrors of a gangster lifestyle that he had lived, survived and conquered as a ruffian on the streets of Chicago. It was in the dark, dingy back streets of the city where he had become ensnared by the drug culture and was not afraid to fight to the death if he had to. This hideous, reprehensible man, for indeed there is no other way to describe him, had relentlessly pursued her for seven years, stalking her without showing any signs of pulling out the plug or retreating. He was obsessed with her, well and truly. She never thought she'd escape his prying eyes, for he watched her with the intensity of a ravenous vulture hankering over a decomposing corpse. It would seem that spying on her unwaveringly had become the order of his every waking moment and the essence of everything that he lived and breathed for. He had looked at her through windows, followed her to libraries and grocery shops, trailed behind her in the car, and sent her amorous letters and gifts in the post expressing his unfailing, ceaseless love for her. Yet despite her best efforts to tell the besotted Joey to leave her alone or simply bog off and get lost, the more she rejected his attentions, the more infatuated and voracious his inflamed passions burned towards her, rather like an insatiable, unquenchable fire that could not be quashed or rescinded. Of course she had reported her encumbrance to the local sheriff, of whom Joey was well known to them as a gangster of some notoriety. The police had never taken her seriously, and had simply given Joey a slap on the wrist and a pitiful caution or reprimand, where he was told to give her a wide girth. In those days they didn't take stalking as seriously as they do now. Of course that had been as helpful as telling a wet dog to dry in the rain. It was never, ever going to happen. And furthermore, he failed to listen to them by unabatingly hankering after her like an impassioned dog on heat, all the more. No one understood the depths of her despair, the levels of trepidation and fear that had sequestered her, holding her hostage and shackling her to an awe-consuming terror. It had devoured her life like a hungry worm in an apple, eating away at her from the inside out, for she had felt so lost and helpless, desperately seeking the security and safety she craved. One day she found a way out of the glass container that had been her life for seven years, but she concluded she was indeed living on borrowed time, for she was absolutely certain one day that Joey's attention towards her would finally turn violent. It happened when she learnt by chance that Joey was actually fighting for his life in a hospital bed after a devastating shootout with some opposing gangsters, but he was expected to make a full recovery. This was her chance to escape and to be finally set free from the attentions of Joey Sutcliffe while he was relegated to the confines of a hospital bed. Indeed, her parents and friends had encouraged her to take a leap of faith and get the hell out of Chicago and disappear so that when Joey had finally recuperated, he would never ever find her again, for she would vanish without a trace. Of course she knew he would survive his injuries, for people like him always did, but she was certain of one thing, he would never ever bother her again. The Rocky Mountain state of Montana had seemed like the perfect quintessential spot in the world for her to disappear and it had worked better than she could have ever contemplated, for she had blended into the new lifestyle as seamlessly as Cinderella had fitted into her golden slipper. Everything about Montana had warmed the cockles of her heart from the friendliness and openness of the people. The lonely isolation of the plains, the majesty of the mountains, the long stretches of roadways, the endless sky, space and fresh air. She had moved to a beguiling wooden farmhouse in the countryside that was as pretty as a picture that had lived up to her wildest, most fanciful dreams and expectations. It was a typical American farmhouse with two stories, an asymmetrical massing, a distinctive front gable, central chimney and wraparound porch with classical columns. The dramatic contrast of the coal roof along with the black wooden window frames and matching shutters against the stark whiteness of the walls was a pronounced contradiction that was visually arresting and aesthetically very appealing. Better still, her home overlooked exquisite mountainous views and was surrounded by wood groves, flowery meadows and awesome walking and hiking trails. What was there not to like? For sixty long years she had called this place her home, had never ever married, worked in the local town and surrounded herself with friends and never once had she ever been afraid, well not until now that is. All the haunting memories of her youth came flooding back to her assaulting her mind with memories she had chosen to suppress, 
of times when the likes of Joey Sutcliffe had robbed her life of peace, for he had stalked and hounded her relentlessly, and she knew he was the real reason that she had never married. Could it be, she pondered to herself, that Joey had found her after all these years, and he was the creeping stranger looking at her through the windows of her home at night, spying on her as he had done in former years? Was it even possible that he had finally managed to find her after sixty years of searching? Surely he was not still fixated on her. She was an old lady, for goodness sake, and her youthful beauty had been fleeting and had now faded. So why would he still be interested in her now? As Paige reflected on all these thoughts, she began to tremble. Her blue eyes almost looked fearful, as the guarded look she'd been wearing at the police station had suddenly dissipated. She fiddled with her purse awkwardly, fumbling around with the clasp, opening it and grabbing out her pink lipstick and hand mirror. It helped to deflect her troubles, to keep her fingers busy and occupied. So with shaking, frail fingers weathered by age, she applied the lipstick to her lips. But her trembling escalated, so the application was very scant. But her little charade had certainly not fooled the sheriff. He knew she was hiding something. I think you've got something that you're keeping from me. You're keeping a secret that you don't want to share. You know who has been spying on you, said the sheriff, suddenly looking directly into Paige's pale blue eyes. I've been a detective for a very long time, Miss Meyer, and I know when someone is being deceptive. You are clearly hiding something from me. The question is, what? That's what I would like to know. Paige tried to avoid the sheriff's discerning eyes. Uh, well, it, it, it's probably just nothing. It, it happened a, a very long time ago. I was a young girl then. And really rather pretty, I'll have you know. That actually turned out to be my biggest problem. What happened? asked the sheriff. Well, I, I was a victim of stalking in Chicago when I was in my early twenties. He was obsessed with me. A nasty piece of work. Oh, he was awful. I ran away to Montana to disappear and to vanish. I, I, I thought I'd never ever see him again. But I mean, I'm an old woman now. Surely he... Her words trailed off and got lost as they became almost disembodied and faint. The sheriff's heart melted like warm chocolate as he watched the tears slowly spilling down the old woman's cheeks. Ah, there now, he said gently, handing the tissues over to her. It's not that bad, surely, if it makes you feel any better. I think it's very unlikely and highly doubtful that your old stalker is suddenly back on the scene. It's been a long time since you were last hounded by him, and there's a lot of water under the bridge. He'd be an old man by now, dealing with all kinds of issues, health problems even. He might not even be alive today. What is this man's name, he asked. It's Joey Sutcliffe. His street name was the Viper. I'll run some checks on him to put your mind at rest, if that makes you feel any better. You wait here. I'll make some inquiries for you. Paige felt relief flood over her mind. Finally, the sheriff was listening and paying attention to her plight. As a victim of stalking, she knew something had been watching her and those familiar ominous feelings had finally returned. Perhaps the sheriff would get to the bottom of this mystery and find the answers that she was looking for. As the sheriff returned to the office with some papers in his hands, the way he walked into the room with a slow deliberation and a downcast expression on his face, she instinctively knew that the news wasn't good, and it concerned Joey Sutcliffe. She was dreading what he was going to tell her. Ah, said the sheriff, this is all very bizarre indeed. It would seem that Mr. Sutcliffe is very much alive today, but he has been missing now for over three weeks. He appears to have vanished from his apartment in Chicago, without a trace, and seemingly disappeared into thin air. The old woman let out a horrified gasp. Oh, oh no, she said, cupping her hands over her mouth. You don't think that... I'm not sure what to think, said the sheriff. Stranger things have happened. Obsession is a very peculiar thing. This man could indeed be still obsessing over you. I gather he has never married, 
Annie's in very good health, regularly partaking in local marathons. So it's possible he could still be your stalker. One of the oldest stalking stories I've ever dealt with, if that is indeed the case. For there is a first time for everything. But we can only hope that he is not the one that is spying on you. He could be camping out in my woodgrove, said Paige, looking alarmed. Sheriff, what should I do? I would like to stay over at your home tonight, if I may, with my deputy sheriff. I want to keep a vigil and an eye on that window of yours, where you claim to have a sighting of the peeper. We will be dropped off at your home in the corner of the road, using the cover of darkness to our advantage, to ensure that the peeper is not aware of our presence, as we will enter your home by the back door and keep a very low profile. Oh, thank you, Sheriff. You've no idea what this means to me. Oh, I think I do, ma'am, said the sheriff, saluting her with his left hand. It was autumn in Montana, and the wind blew through the towering logpole pines, causing the fine needles to rustle, and these hundred-foot skyscrapers appeared to almost jiggle and dance under the dark sky. It was menacing, a friendless night, with a cold, biting chill to the air, and the sound of crickets and frogs appeared very subdued. It was just as well the sheriff and his deputy were wearing headlamps and were armed with flashlights, for the scattering of stars and the moon was very obscure and inconspicuous. Oh, my word! Forget autumn. Winter is almost here, Ernest piped the deputy. It's a freezing night. Do you think we'll see any action tonight? I sincerely hope so, said the sheriff. The poor old dear is in a dreadful state. At the very least, we want answers. We need to find out who or what is spying on her. She is very unsettled. She's clearly been a victim of stalking, and that's not pleasant for anyone. We need to give her some kind of reassurance. You think it could really be her ex-stalker, Sheriff? It sounds a bit far-fetched to me. I mean, the woman is so old. I mean, surely he wouldn't be interested in her now. If he was going to be chasing anyone, surely he'd be chasing someone that was about twenty. I don't know what to think, Deputy. Obsession is a very peculiar thing, and I've seen things in this line of work that would make your hair curl. So honestly, nothing would surprise me. That evening the sheriff and his deputy were whisked stealthily into the old woman's cosy home, where they sat very discreetly on the furthest couch in the far corner of the living area, where they drank strong mugs of coffee to stay awake and tucked into sweet black forest chocolate doughnuts. It was opposite a window where the curtains were drawn so as to avoid detection and to remain unnoticeable. The old woman was seated on the upholstered chair close to the fire crackling away in the grate that overlooked a window which the curtains remained open, where she usually spotted the shadowy figure looking in at her with deep-set dark eyes. She recoiled in horror at the memory of that horrifying moment when she realised that she wasn't alone. She extracted her knitting and put on the television. The bait had been set. But would the peeper take a bite? That was the question. Would he be peering in at her tonight? In her heart she crossed her fingers and toes and hoped that this night would be fruitful. The television blared away loudly, in succession to the clicking of the old lady's knitting. The sheriff sat silently on the couch, listening and waiting with bated breath, but for a while nothing happened. But then his ears perked up as he discerned a noise and indicated for everyone to stay quiet. Shh! Shh! He was certain he'd picked up a rustling sound, but with the wind blowing against the rafters of the house, it could literally be anything. Then he heard the rustling sound again, and then a rattling sound, and he clutched his pistol and manoeuvred himself stealthily along the wall, facing the window that overlooked the old woman. Then he saw it, a dark face peering into the window, with bright eyes and a large flat nose smudged against the pane. He immediately indicated to his deputy to follow him, and they silently exited through the back door of the kitchen and began to cautiously creep around to the front of the house towards the living area, where the intruder was engaged in his espionage. The wind was blowing against the house, causing one of the loose shutters to rattle quite violently. 
The detective, upon seeing the large figure wearing a thick black woolly coat, looking in through the living room at the old lady, skilfully emerged from his hiding place and cautiously, surreptitiously crept towards the man. This is the police, he said. Hands up. The large figure turned around to look directly at the sheriff. Its treacle-coloured eyes exuded a menacing red eyeshine, which was exceedingly intimidating. This was not a man in a fur coat as he'd first suspected. This was something else. But what in the heck was it? The cocky confidence of the sheriff dissipated like the vaporous steam from a kettle, and his fingers began to tremble and shake while his heart pounded violently in his chest, causing his whole body to vibrate. For a second, it was like the hands of time stood still, and every single passing second seemed to last a lifetime, for the sheriff knew he was standing in the presence of a mighty apex predator. Suddenly he felt like a silly little kid, with a pathetic toy gun in his hands, as using a weapon against this being would be futile and crazy for this would make the creature even angrier, and put his life in great jeopardy. The sturdy, robust, seemingly bulletproof creature towered at about eight foot tall, and was built like a rhino in terms of its immense stocky proportions and very pronounced muscular density. It was solid, burly, lofty and powerful, and luxuriously swathed in a silky long coat of black hair that was blacker than the night and the severe contrast between the creature's hair and the dusky sky was strikingly sinister. The outside light enabled the sheriff to see the obscure features of the creature more clearly, where the charcoal black of the leathery hairless face merged seamlessly into the pitch blackness of his hair. Without a doubt, its ponderous heftiness made him appear like a ghostly shadow figure, or like something supernaturally anomalous. What was this creature, the sheriff wondered, It looked human, especially the face, but the dome shape of the head and the overlong arms reminded him of a primate. One thing he knew for certain was that this creature was highly intelligent, and by the truculent expression upon its face it was not best pleased to be challenged like this, and its discerning eyes darted from the sheriff's face to the weapon in his hands that was by now pointed loosely at the creature. The creature curled back its lips, releasing a deep, low, guttural growl that aggressed from the back of his throat and sounded like thunderous rocks rolling down a high embankment or like the centres of the earth splitting in two and cracking open like a large egg. It was a sound that spoke of treacherous animal power and primal savagery, a sound birthed from our deepest fears and our darkest, most terrifying nightmares. In a seamless lunging motion, the overlong muscular arms seized the sheriff's weapon and threw it up towards the chimney, hitting it with a hole in one. Now defenceless, the sheriff stood there like a gormless frozen statue, just gawking at the creature with helpless glazed eyes that were seemingly locked in a trance. He struggled to break free from this invisible hold, but was powerless to do so. Why could he not bolt back to the house right now? What in the heck was wrong with him? He could feel the presence of death looming ever closer, ready to snatch him and drag him away, kicking and screaming. For he knew he was not ready to die. Not yet. Please, no. All of a sudden, the sound of the deputy sheriff's firearm went off, and he shot several rounds in the air and like grease lightning, the creature thundered away, moving into the wood grove at an immense speed, with the grace and elegance of a cheetah. "'Sheriff, are you all right?' said the deputy. "'You're as white as a sheet. What in the heck was that thing?' The sheriff turned to look at his deputy. "'That,' he said to the deputy, "'was my worst nightmare that came to life.' I learnt about this incredible story from my grandfather, who was the sheriff in town when this happened many moons ago. And although he's now deceased, I'm in absolutely no doubt that the creature he encountered that night was in fact a Bigfoot, who was clearly very curious about Paige, and not one bit happy about being challenged by the sheriff. I was to learn that my grandfather never told Paige about the monster he'd encountered, because he didn't want her to live in fear but was able to assure her that the vagrant he had seen was not Joey Sutcliffe. It would seem the old woman began to breathe again, as her relief was immense. 
As far as Joey Sutcliffe was concerned, his deceased body was one day found floating down a lake in Chicago, and foul play was suspected. If any good did come from that evening, my grandfather informed me that the old woman was never bothered by the creature ever again, and died peacefully in her own home at the grand age of 93. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, that was a fabulous story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time, goodbye and good night.